So databases at university versus databases in reality. Again, we're using that meme. So I showed before. So what we want to look at, at today is, is really this is gap between what you learn here and what you will be observing in the industry. So they're also good companies, they know what they're doing, they have a great technology stack, they, they, they know databases, they do the right things, or mostly do the right things, but uh, there, there are many companies that don't, yeah, and that's really a problem. And that's what I wanted to prepare you uh, for a little bit. Yeah? So uh, I will use this kind of table, there's always something we learned here in class and relationship modeling, um, the relational model and relational algebra and stuff. And then I say, okay, what you see in reality, and then give you some hint to some additional technique that may be helpful to master such a situation. So I taught you, okay, use entity relationship models. So, uh, to, uh, scribble this uh, big diagram somewhere, be it electronically on a, on a big whiteboard. And only when you're done with that, when you're happy with that diagram, jump into actually creating it into, into a system. Well, here comes reality. In reality, you see there's no modeling uh, happening very often. People start directly with a creating create table in some database or through an ORM. Yeah, and then the, the database model like uh, grows and grows increment, incre incrementally over years and years and years. And so basically a developer understands, oh, there's some field missing. Uh, I want to store some data in the database. Let's create a table without always fully understanding what the heck the data model is, the rest of the data model is about. Yeah? And that leads to very big schemas with thousands or ten thousands of tables um, um, in certain cases, and that's a problem. Because then if you develop an application against such a database schema, yeah, how do you ever understand ten thousand tables? Sometimes there's no interaction with customers, that's a big mistake. Yeah? So as I told you, when you uh, um, create an entity relationship model, you have the opportunity to show that model to the, cost the customer, uh, to ask the customer, hey, I understood it like this, uh, here's an end to m relationship. Is that what you have in mind? Is that what you want to do? Sh shall I uh, is it really that I sh should model this data? Should I model that data? Can I leave it away? Blah, 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 blah. You can really make a, a session with the customer, uh, teach the customer briefly the core ideas of that model and ask questions. And that's very, very helpful. Um, yeah, then what you see in practice also other data models like XML, JSON, key value style models, object oriented models like we learned about in Django, which, which is okay, of course, graph models, um, and so forth and so forth. And in particular, no logical data independence. Yeah? What that is, I will explain in a moment. Yeah? That, that's often neglected in those systems. When it comes to the relational model, so we have relations, sets of tuples, what you see in practice is rather tables. So tables as yeah, like a sequence of tuples that may have duplicates and also has an order. Yeah? Or maybe sometimes the order is even used for queries. Uh, again, that's typically iteratively extended over the years by adding attributes. For instance, so in practice, you may run into tables that have hundreds or thousands of attributes. Yeah? Because whenever there's an attribute missing, people add another attribute, and then it's a wild mess, and no one understands uh, what's going on. Sometimes that's hidden under the ORM, yeah? which may be OK, um, but, but it can also be separated. Um, uh, there may be many redundancies. That's typically what you observe in these schemas, be it on um, yeah, yeah, yeah. these schemas you see that grew over time, yeah, typically uh, model the same ideas multiple times. Yeah? So one developer models it in that part of the schema, the other developer models it in that part of the schema, and then you have redundancies and all kinds of trouble when currying or uh, trying to make the data uh, consistent. So you, uh, you see le legacy fields. Yeah? So the database schema then may contain attributes that are not used at all by, by, any, of the, by, by any of the applications. Yeah? But still, it's in the database. No views, so you only have access to, um, you directly access those tables, but you don't shield tables by views. And what you also see is two broadly defined domains. Yeah? So it's always a good idea to think about when you declare um, a column, when you declare an attribute for, for a relation, okay, what is the domain? What is the uh, type of the values I want to enter there? Yeah? And often that's it's, uh, picked way too broadly. Yeah, well, one good example, for instance, um, in a, master, uh, in a master application system, uh, when you apply for the university and people enter 
uh, the university where they got uh, their, their degree, you could make the decision to, okay, that, that's text, that's string. So I ask people to enter a string for their university. That, for instance, leads to the problem that um, um, people may write the same university in, in various spellings. Yes, you, you may write Saarbrücken University, Saarland University, Saarland U, University of the Saarland, yeah, uh, UDS, uh, blah, 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 Saarbrücke, Uni, I don't know how that's spelled in Saarlandish. Yeah, um, yeah all, all kinds of different spellings meaning the same thing. Yes, so it's typical an opportunity to get rid of a domain and to make an extra table where you enter uh, the universities and with a foreign key relationship and then you have people pick from that drop-down list. Yeah? So these kind of decisions uh, can be made in, in modeling, of course. Yeah, yeah um, we will talk about a little bit about normalization. What that means, we talked about ORM already. Uh, I think that can be removed there because this year we did it earlier. Um, so we don't talk about that today. You learned about, uh, already about ORM and Django. But again, logical data independence, I will tell you. Um, then when it comes to relational algebra, you also see this pattern um, that programming libraries tend to reinvent the wheel. So pandas is uh, the worst case really in that regard. So pandas is a very popular data science library which is terrible, with an absolutely terrible user interface, uh, but it's widespread in data science. Yeah? It's basically a weird implementation of relational algebra without the optimization yeah, but it has become popular. These things happen. Yes? So bad things may become popular, and Pandas is such a case. Um, so basically, the idea is you have CSV files, read them into Pandas data frames, They're basically tables in, in that sense, and then you do so certain types of analysis. So that's the reality, and if your project uses Pandas, you have to live with that. Yeah? Maybe you're giving away some optimization opportunities there. Okay, so let's... Uh, talk about independence. So I mentioned physical data independence early on. That's one of the very strong features of databases. And the idea is that the database schema you define is independent of its physical, oops, it's independent of its physical real, realization. So when defining a schema, we don't worry about what, what are the data structures and indexes and data layouts and representations, uh, the disks and SSDs I'm storing the data in. We really don't care. Yeah? So that's what we call the logical layer. Yeah? That's where we define the database schema. And uh, the job of the database system is then to map it to a physical layer, to physical structures. Yeah? We talked about B trees in this lecture, for instance. It's not your job to tell the database system, hey, please use a B tree. That's not your job. That's the job of the database system to find out eventually. Yeah? And the same holds for mapping all of this data to physical devices. Yeah? And that's an extremely strong feature because it allows you to um, yeah, rewire this mapping. Yeah? However you map data from the logical layer to the physical layer, you can later on change that. Yeah? It's not carved in stone. It's not part of the database schema. Your database schema is logical. Yeah? And that is what we call physical data independence, meaning this layer is independent from its physical realization. And that's the super strong part, but because it also allows the database system to scale like whatever, to whatever size you want. Yeah? Because uh, when you define a schema, you don't have to worry about scalability. It's, it's really, if you want to scale it to a, a galaxy size database system, you can do that. Yeah? You just have to think about how to map um, the schema to the physical layer. Yeah? But, but that's what the database uh, jobs is about, basically. Yeah? So that's physical database independence. And you get that for free. But there's a second type of independence, data independence, that's called logical data independence. And you, you still find that in textbooks, but, but it's rarely used. And, and there are reasons for not using it, but there are some cases where you maybe want to uh, use that. And that's one um, layer above. So here it's basically, um, so I, the idea here is uh, that you protect the logical layer, the schema, and even hide that schema under another layer. So that means um, you create views, yeah? so create view as uh, select star tra la 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 la, as we learned that when talking about SQL, uh, but you don't give direct access to the logical layer. Yeah? That means any application that's being implemented is written against those views only. Yeah? For instance, um, assume you have yeah, a university, yeah, let's assume 
Um, we have a university with, with a large database schema and there are different applications. You could make a view just for the transcript of record application. You could make a view just for the um, uh, whatever, want to go on holiday application yeah? or BAFIC application or something like that. Yeah? So just a subset of the schema is exposed in those views. Only, only on the schema that's necessary to implement those applications is exposed to those views. And that's what you could do. And when you do that, you can at any time change the schema yeah? without, um, in all cases, having to change the views. Yeah? That's the same thing as here, as when we go back. Yeah? So yeah, here, uh, in physical data independence, you can change the physical implementation of the schema. The schema doesn't have to be changed. Yeah? You just change its physical realization. And the same happens here in logical data independence. You can say, okay, no matter what these views are doing, I can change the schema for whatever reason uh, uh, without notifying those views. Yeah? I mean, that gets difficult if, if you add, a, add an attribute here, of course, and you want to expose the attribute to one of the views. Yeah? You still have to change the view here. Yeah? So, okay, sometimes it doesn't work, but it gives you another layer of protection, in particular to separate data for different applications. Yeah, once you, um, what that allows you to do, for instance, is uh, that you can have different access control for those views. Yeah? So you could say, okay, there's a certain type of user role that may access data through this view, Another type of user may access data to that view and so forth and so forth. And no one is allowed to access data directly on that schema. So that gives you another level of security. So typically in, in today's web applications, the stuff is not used. So the web application like Django will have full access rights to all of the data here. And that's typically how it is done in Django. It's okay for, for, for small applications, but hmm. yeah, you, can, you could use that. So that's what I'm trying to phrase on this slide. Yeah? So basically, that's the trade-off here. Yeah? So for web applications that run on a database that's not shared with other applications, logical data independence is typically not implemented. Actually, I haven't seen that uh, at all in any of those web applications so far. So it's not implemented on the database layer. Yeah? How, um, however, you, you, if you think about what we did with these REST API endpoints, yeah, these views in Django, those are basically wrappers around the schema. So they're kind of implementing logical data independence. Yeah? Uh, sorry, if the application only sees the views, how does it insert data? You can still insert through views under certain rules. Depends uh, on the database system. Yeah, there, are, there, are rule, uh, there are views you can't insert or update. Yeah? But if the database system can figure out what you mean, you can still insert uh, through the views. Yeah? Yeah, but, but it's a problem yeah, you're running into. And that's, that's one reason why people are not using it, because uh, you do a view and then say, oh, I can't insert an update. Okay, let's get rid of the views and do it directly. Yeah, that's, kind of, that's how it works in reality. Yeah? Yeah, good point. Okay, so however, if you're um, developing a web application that shares data with another app, you may want to consider implementing logical data independence on the database layer. Yeah? So that's this university scenario. Yeah? If it's really a huge thing, a huge shared schema uh, with uh, many, many tables, but you want to really separate the applications, you may want to consider that, yeah? just for security reasons, but also to understand what the heck um, is used in which application. Mm -hmm. So what you often see in, in large applications is, yeah, in particular, when you have a, a large schema with many tables, yeah? Yeah, so now, now you have 10,000 tables and you want to understand, okay, which application is using which table? Yeah, who is responsible for that? It, it's a nightmare. Yeah? And, I mean, let's hope you have tools that um, give you the information like, okay, referenced by or used by. Yeah? But uh, yeah, let's hope for the best. Okay, normalization. That's, who heard about normalization like first, second normal form before? How come in school or in school or just in school? Okay, cool. Okay, which school was that? Uh, ah, okay, cool. Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, and you? You also raise your hand? Ah, yeah. Okay, right. Okay, so there's some debate on whether this stuff is needed. Actually, if you model your schema well using entity relationship modeling, you don't need this stuff. Yeah? Normalization is important 
uh, when you reverse engineer an existing schema, yeah, when, you, when you are brave enough to see, oh, there's a schema, there's an application running on that, but I have the guts to really re-engineer all of that, no matter what I'm going to break in the application. I will make it clean and perfect. No matter whether 100 application developers are working on this shitty schema, I will reverse engineer that. Yeah, good luck with that in, in a real uh, company. Yeah, but you could do that. Yeah? And then normalization theory is actually very helpful. It's basically yeah, a set of rules and algorithms allowing you to get rid of yeah, redundancies in your schema, yeah? stuff that's modeled multiple times in your schema, which leads to all kinds of update anomalies. Yeah? So it's a good tool um, to reverse engineer existing schemas, but it's a bit outdated. Yeah? In particular, when you think about what, what domains are in SQL 92, yeah? so, um, as of SQL uh, 92, domains had to be atomic. Yeah? It's a single value, it's a single integer, a single string, but, but not uh, a record or not a nested table like in SQL 99. Yeah? But normalization theory is basically about SQL 92. Yeah? And that's kind of weird yeah, when you think about that. So first normal form is actually a, a contradiction already to modern SQL yeah? because you, it, uh, domains don't have to be atomic in SQL anymore. That's a very old uh, thing. Yeah, then this procedural versus declarative way of reading. Yeah, you already see that when you um, reason about relational algebra, logical operators or even physical operators. And we had a separate slide on that where I said, okay, we read it declaratively so far, yeah, but now we're reading it procedurally. Meaning uh, if there's a certain order defined, like in this plan, for instance, yeah, you can read it like, okay, I first do the cross product of directors and director genres. Yeah, then I do the filter on this condition, then I do the filter on that condition, then I do the projection on that uh, no, condition. Yeah, that's a procedural way of reading it. So the, the order of execution is determined. Yeah? The, or you, you interpret this uh, plan as, oh yeah, the order is defined. Yeah? But the other interpretation is, no, it's declarative. It's just declarative. It's a, it's, it's a declarative way uh, of saying what the user wants to compute. Yeah? You could confuse it with a program that actually under, um, executes these things in that order, but, but it, both interpretations are absolutely valid. Yeah? And you see that when you use uh, libraries like Spark. Yeah? Spark, as I said, is basically relational algebra plus plus. Yeah? When you write an expression um, like, like, like this expression in Spark, um, yeah, it basically looks, it looks, looks something like that. Yeah, Spark has the option to guess what? Do query optimization, do rule-based rewrites, yeah, change the order of operations, understand that, hey, what the heck, that, that, I mean, come on, you can rewrite that to a join operator, which is way more efficient. Yeah? So the same things were learned in this lecture. Yeah? So you have these two interpretations and you have to be careful um, to, um, to distinguish the two. Yeah? In reality, you will see that sometimes query processing pipelines are hard-coded yeah? through some library, for instance, Panda style libraries that yeah, define procedurally first do this, first do that, first do that. Yeah, and then you give away the um, optimization opportunity you have through rule based rewrite or even cost based rewrites. Yeah? And that may lead to problems. Yeah? So that's, that's a typical thing to look at when you see pipelines in reality that are hard coded. Hey, what, what if I allow for a query optimization? Yeah? Would, would that help me already? Yeah, so some more concepts. So we learn about SQL, and yeah, in reality you see this, often you see there's only SQL 92 being used, and that only partially. Um, so, I mean, there are companies that basically use databases as a file system, kind of, as yeah? this CRUD style access, create, read, update, delete, yeah, tuple-wise access. You, you, you read individual tuples into your application server, and then you have application logic to, to do query processing, for instance, to do grouping, to do joining, yeah, stuff that could be delegated to the database system. And that's a bad idea, yeah? um, because it reinvents parts of SQL and the query optimizer. Yeah, so you shouldn't do that. It basically, uh, by definition, makes your application uh, unscalable. Um, yeah, leads to post yeah, another thing you also see is SQL hints, which can be uh, ba bad or good. SQL hints meaning you can annotate your SQL statement uh, by a hint 
like star transformation, for instance. Yeah? And in data warehouses, you can uh, give a hint to the database system what you mean. And that may uh, help the query optimizer to uh, come up with a different plan. Uh, this, but, but this can also fire back and uh, create a back, uh, bad plan. So that's, that's a problem there. And the other thing you will be seeing is materialized views. Um, again, recall when I introduced views, I said those are dynamic views. It's just an alias. It's just, just a query definition which is not executed once you define it. Only when you use it in another query, it's being copied into the query as a subquery and then optimized. But you don't prematerialize that. Many database systems in the 90s used the idea to materialize views. Huh? You can say create materialized view foo as tralala, and then the results get really uh, stored somewhere. Yeah? And that leads to all kinds of problems. Yeah? Many systems still do that. My message is don't do it. We are in 2023. It's not um, needed anymore. And I will tell you a nice uh, horror story about that in a moment. Um, data economy. So meaning you only uh, save, uh, you only model the data that's required um, to, um, yeah, to do your job, to, to implement the application. Yeah? When you think about the NSA uh, um, use scenario we had. Yeah? So is there data you may leave away yeah? to, to, to better preserve the privacy of the user? What you see in practice is people don't think about that too much. So if there's data you can collect, you collect it. Yeah? So you have to enter all kinds of data in those forms, which may lead uh, to problems. So data collection many uh, is a standard actually. Yeah, asset. Um, yeah, we, we, that's basically the properties of the, tran tran what the transactional properties database systems should implement. What you see in practice is that uh, there are systems that only do this per tuple. Yes, yeah? so you have uh, transactional semantics per tuple, like in key value stores. Uh, key value stores. Um, I have a separate uh, slide for that explaining that, yeah? but that's not what the database system offers. Yeah? So we're, database systems has, has uh, asset semantics over whatever you put into your transaction. Yeah? Maybe, maybe many, many tuples. Consistency, um, that's also something I mean, we learned about in the context of foreign key conditions. Key co or, or the primary key or unique or stuff like that. Yeah? You have constraints um, that, that, that you phrase against your relation on Django, the model, yeah, in, this, in our meta class, you could uh, write down those constraints, but there are more things you can do. And one is called triggers. Yeah? I will explain that briefly. Then we talked at length about isolation. There you will see all possible relaxations, of course, by lowering the isolation level, um, but, but, but sometimes um, in particular for distributed applications, there's something that's called eventual consistency. Yeah? And that this is okay for certain types of applications and helps you to scale out. And for durability, well, yeah, it's somehow part of the backup strategy, but um, there are certain tricks you have to be aware of with a database system that it can ensure durability. And, and they are sometimes not followed. Yeah? So in particular, when it comes to where do you store the log file, that's a topic for the core lecture, actually. So we didn't talk much about durability. But if the database system um, wants to guarantee that, you have to do many, many things to make sure that the database's algorithms work well. Yeah? And for that, you have to make sure that the log file it creates is persisted uh, for committing transactions. And that's a longer story. I'll explain in the core lecture. Yeah, um, so here's another thing um, that also gives you some idea on um, where, where to implement things. Yeah, that basically goes back to the point I had here. Um, here, this first thing. That's the, uh, what I mean by okay. You could use a database system to fetch tuples here, fetch tuples there, do kind of a join in your application server, do kind of a group by in your application server, and write some data back, rather than doing the join and the group by on the SQL level. Uh, that's, you could do that, and I've seen that uh, happening in practice. And here, this um, slide gives you an idea what the problems with that are, what you should actually do. So assume we want to filter some data. Yeah? So as a user, um, that wants to filter the data. Well, you could do it as follows. You could say the user, 
you display all data to the user. Basically, whatever you store in the system is displayed on the front end to the user and the user manually uh, goes through the data and says, oh yeah, yeah, that's an interesting tuple. No, that's not, that's interesting, that's not, that's interesting, that's not. Yeah, so that's a lot of manual work the user has to do in that case. The other option is to say, no, you send, so basically here you would be sending all the data uh, from, from the files uh, um, uh, but, but through the database system, through the application server, through the front end to the user. Yeah? So the front end would display all of that data. The other option is you only, um, yeah, write like that, you only display it up to here. Yeah? Basically to the front end and then in the front end, say on the, on the web browser, in, in that client that you're using, in some JavaScript code, whatever, you filter out the qualifying tuples. Yeah? Say the user is interested in whatever, um, or students from, why doesn't this write? I don't know what writes. Um, let's say all students from Saarbrücken. Yeah. Yeah, you, could, could do, you could implement that by, by saying, okay, I send all the students up to the front end and the front end filters out the students that live in Saarbrücken. Yeah, that's one way of doing that. Other option is to only send it up to the application server. Yeah, to say, um, okay, I send all the students data up to the application server, application server will filter out the Saarbrücken students. Or you do it in the database system. Yeah, database system will filter out the Saarbrücken students. Or you do it in the operating system. If the operating system will filter out, why doesn't this work? Oh. The operating system will filter out um, the, the, the students from Saarbrücken. Yeah? That's another way of doing that. This. Okay. Right? So wh wh what's the problem with that? Do you see any problems with the different approaches? Yeah? Let's, let's uh, talk about the, the first, first scenario. Let's talk about, I mean, I hope none of you would filter out the data on the front end. Well, it, it's a valid way of doing that. Yeah? Filtering it out here versus filtering it out on the database system. What, what are the trade-offs? What, what may be problems with the different approaches? Yeah, let's talk about the front-end scenario first. Yeah, you send all the student data for all students from Saarland University to the front-end. Yeah. So I have to put my, ah, that's a trick, okay. Yeah, send all the data up to the front end and then you do the filtering. So what's the problem with that? Yeah. Uh, the user can use the debugger and then see everything. A debugger, let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but, but yeah, yeah, it might happen. Yeah, if, oh, sure. Yeah, actually there might be a privacy problem there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's good. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so we send a lot of data over the network. Basically, the entire student's relation is sent to the client. I don't, I don't know how many data that is. Maybe this is students. Next time it's measurements from sensor data, temperature sensor data, millions and billions of records is being, being sent to the client. This is completely stupid. It's a really bad idea. You shouldn't do that. Whereas as you filter it out already on the database system. That's option two. Yeah, so here, okay, the files... However, the database system finds, uh, gets the data from the file system, but then the database system will do the, 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 the job, yeah, filter out the students and only th send the qualifying students up in the stack, which means the network load here and here would be dramatically reduced, just sending the stuff that, that's required. Yeah? That, that's a clear trade-off. Yeah? Okay, but what if you do, yeah? what if you do something like this? Yeah? You could say, um, okay, you fill the option one as you filter it on the database server. server. Ah, no, I don't want to do this. Um, this browsing thing is broken. Here. So you filter it on the database server. Why doesn't this work? Versus you filter it in hardware. And these, these uh, things actually exist. There's something that's called smart disks. 
for instance, it works for hard disks, but also for SSDs, where you can send down application logic to the hardware, to the SSD, and you could uh, instruct certain types of SSD to say, SSDs to say, hey, just give me, don't give me the entire relation, just give me all students from Zabrücken. That's also called smart disks, and there, there are many, many vari variants of that, particular with, with uh, hardware technology like uh, FPGAs, you can do uh, th these tricks. Uh, you can do a similar thing, two layers uh, down, so to say, and then basically you filter out uh, the tuples already here and you only send the qualifying tuples up to the operating system, to the file system, and to the database system. The database system doesn't have to do any filtering job anymore. Yeah. Could you imagine what the advantages of such an approach could be? Yeah? Decreasing the? Yeah, the RAM usage, yeah, depending on how these uh, algorithms are implemented in the database system, that's correct. Yeah, that, that is true. That's another thing. Yeah, you? Yes, yeah, that, that's a very generic answer. Reducing the workload the database system has to do because the database system now only gets a subset of the data to process and not all of the data. So whatever the algorithms it uses, it only gets a subset. But uh, another important effect is uh, the network yeah, so the, the bandwidth, the data that's being sent, yeah, so we had it here, if, if you assume, okay, there's data being sent in that other scenario to the front end via the internet, yeah, so these arrows kind of um, stand for some sort of uh, data transfer, some sort of connection in between those layers. Yeah? And here it's the internet, but in between here, it's uh, yeah, some, some bus in the system, yeah, some uh, bandwidth, uh, memory bus, or whatever, what the data is being sent. And even that has an effect, yeah? whether you send uh, one terabyte of data via uh, the memory bus or one gigabyte, well, that's a heck of a difference. Yeah? And there will, you will save time. So the idea of pushing down, it's, 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 uh, it's the same idea as, as we learned about in predicate push down. Yeah? You push down the filter as uh, much down as possible to the leaves. And here I'm pushing down the predicate into, uh, into the hardware to make sure even, yeah, uh, I'm, not, I'm not happy with pushing it to the leaves, I actually make sure that those leaves are executed on the hardware. Yeah? And that that's plays a huge role in particular for systems that ha uh, have huge data sets to process, uh, uh, big data systems, if you uh, wish. And uh, they try to push down predicates into the hardware or the operating system, and then that makes a huge difference. So, yeah, okay. So, in general, this means, uh, okay, what, what do you impl implement um, user logic? Yeah? So, again, for data intensive operations, as far down the stack as possible, so it's basically predicate push down, advantages are da less data is sent around. This advantage, not always easy to realize and often not necessary for development as no performance problem. So this is really uh, something you may worry about when you have to do heavy lifting, when there's large data sets. In general, for database functionality, um, you can implement a lot of functionality in the DBMS. So if in doubt, I would always consider why not implement it in the DBMS. If you look at application code and feel like, hey, that, that sounds like a group by, that sounds like a join, no. Yeah, you should uh, delegate it down to the database system because then you're in that space where the database system can optimize. Yeah? You don't have to worry about access times and stuff. Uh, the database optimizer will do the job. Yeah? And uh, we had an example in, in last week's uh, assignment sheet yeah? for um, yeah, when you think about, okay, now I get some data in my Django web application. I fetch it into my browser. Yeah, and someone else does the same thing, and now concurrently someone does a change of something that I want to change as well. You're in transaction business. However, the data in the browsers is not protected by trans transactions. Yeah? Yeah, if you do the, the transactions inside the database system, yeah, you have protection through asset and the transactional semantics and algorithms, but if you create a copy of the data in your web browsers, anything may happen. So you have to have extra protection to, to make sure that you don't uh, corrupt your data. Yeah? Okay. 
Yeah, then key value stores. Yeah, that's a very widespread uh, type of system um, used in, in web uh, development um, in many places. And uh, the idea is that it allows for efficient storage and retrieval of keys mapped to arbitrary values. Yeah, that's, that's all it provides for, basically. So basically, um, so here's an example where you have, um, yeah, like, um, ID, yeah, so a key value mapping. That's, that's, that's all what it's about. So you map a certain ID, say 42, to some sort of JSON document uh, or some other document. Yeah? And then when you want to retrieve a particular uh, um, document that has a certain ID and you happen to know the ID, if you don't know the ID, you, you, you're in trouble. But if you know the ID, you can uh, very quickly retrieve uh, that document by just specifying that specific ID. Yeah? So it's basically just the job an index would do, a hash map would do, a B tree would do in a standard relation. So these key value stores do only this. Um, transactions over multiple keys are typically not supported um, and functionality in queries that cannot be mapped to key value semantics are usually insufficiently supported. Meaning, assume you want to do a group by, you want to do a join, you don't query by the ID used for that uh, key definition in your key value store, you query by some other attribute, well, then you're in trouble. Then you can't use a key value store efficiently. Or you create additional indexes, like in a database, but basically you're in trouble. Yeah? These systems are um, used widely, and uh, yeah, you could question whether that makes sense. Yeah? But, but in reality, you will see those systems. I mean, when you think about that, the key value mappings you have to do with, one is a URL to the content of a website. Yeah, when, when you enter a browser, uh, when you open a browser and then uh, in the URL field, you enter URL, that's a key. Yeah? And that is mapped to the content of a specific website. So that's a key value store. The entire internet is a key value store, if you wish. And the same holds for any file system. Yeah? So you have a hierarchical file path, yeah? whatever, slash user, slash uh, Jens Dietrich slash home slash desktop uh, slash to do dot txt. Yeah, that's a uh, possible, that's a key on my file system and that is mapped to the contents of a file. Yeah? So the byte stream that's available in that specific file. Yeah? Guess what? It's a key value store. Yeah? So basically any file system is already a key value store in that regard. They're very specific and yeah, specialized for, for running on a specific system, but uh, yeah, it's a key value store. Yeah, so the advantages of, of these systems are they are very efficient and sufficient if no other access patterns are needed. Um, some products usually also offer scale out, meaning so these key value stores are relatively easy to install on a in a distributed environment yeah, to, to thousands of machines. When you really store large amounts of data, it's really, really easy to do. In contrast, uh, try that with a database system. Uh, good luck then. Yeah, that's really uh, awkward, uh, typically. Yeah? But, but for key value stores, it's really easy to install. Yeah? But the use case is kind of limited, though. And again, um, these key value stores are slow for queries that don't query uh, via the key. Um, well, in fact, as I said, it's just an index or a hash map. Yeah? So the first thing I would think about when, when you see a key value store is, well, couldn't I do the same thing in my relational database system and just, I mean, basically it's a, yeah, I mean, wait, 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 what is a key value store? So basically you, you do a relation like this. Here's my relation. Yeah, and then you have one attribute that's called key and you have one attribute that's called value. Yeah, that's your key value store. And then all you need to do is, I mean, basically the database system will do that in most cases itself anyhow, uh, create an index on that attribute. Well, then you created your first key value store. Congratulations. Uh, and then the question is, is that enough to support my workload? If so, yeah, we don't have to install an extra key value store system yeah, because database system will do the job. Mm -hmm. Again, think about the discussion we had when we talked about graphs and, having, and running multiple systems uh, in your stack concurrently. Yeah? And then you have to be careful to, oh, when I update here, I also update there. There are all kinds of consistency issues. Yeah? You try to uh, consolidate your data in one system. And uh, if you have a separate system, you always uh, yeah, run, run into the risk of um, creating more problems. 
So event condition action uh, rules or triggers, yeah, that's something that you may uh, use to attack consistency problems in your database system. And that's something that some database systems or some applications use wild and others not so much. However, it's a very interesting tool to make sure that you don't screw up data consistency in your database. So um, these um, ECA means the following. So that there's an event that uh, you specify and a condition that must hold, that is checked for that specific event. And if that condition holds, you execute a specific action. Yeah? So there is an event you monitor on the event, there is some condition being fulfilled, and if that is the case, you trigger a certain action. And databases have uh, yeah, a lot of support for these kind of rules. Yeah? So a database trigger allows these ECA rules to be formulated directly in the database system. And here's an example how that looks like. So you could do something like this. You could say, okay, I create a trigger, log update, that means after any update on the accounts relation, for each row, if the old, um, if this old state of that row, of that tuple, is distinct from the new state, then you execute a specific function. In this case, this, this function could store the old value into an extra table to keep track of different versions. Huh? So with that, you could basically add uh, like a versioning relation on top of the database system. And that would happen once you declare that, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Huh? So, so that, that's all done magically. And all kinds of consistency uh, rules can be implemented like that. For instance, if you have um, yeah, constraints like a professor must at most give like four lectures. You can implement that through triggers. Yeah? Or a professor must give at least two lectures per semester. You can do that th uh, through triggers rather than on the application layer. Yeah? That's a very powerful tool. If you're interested in that, uh, for previous iteration of this lecture, I did a video explaining that. Uh, it's in German, however but I explain it uh, using Postgres. Postgres SQL is very powerful in that regard. Actually, Postgres has two different trigger mechanisms. One is called the root system and the other is standard SQL triggers. So this is very powerful, very suitable for complex consistency conditions, tracing, event-based, changing of relations. Now, these things can be implemented where they belong in the database system. Right? You don't have to fiddle around in the application code, but you do it in the database system. Yeah, that's um, um, a very good idea. In particular, in scenarios where the database system is shared for many applications. You only do it once and the triggers, and then all applications benefit from that. It's, however, not that easy to use. Yeah, the syntax is, uh, has room for improvement, let's, let's phrase it like that. Um, it's difficult to debug. Yeah? So what if you want to find out, okay, now I de define like a dozen triggers in my database system, what happened? Yeah, maybe this trigger did a change that triggered another trigger, yeah? and then there's a cascade of triggers running through your database system. Actually, you can easily mess that up to have infinite loops of triggers yeah? if you do it uh, the wrong way. So it's not so, it's not so easy. Yeah? And it's actually also rather slow at times. Yeah? It can, can be a performance problem. But if you are careful and just here and there for very important consistency constraints, it's a good idea to do something like this, eh, rather than doing it on the application level. Okay, yeah, more concepts we learned about. So security, um, yeah, that, that's of course uh, a big topic, and we have many lectures here at university, of course. Um, I just mentioned a few of the concepts, but, but the, the major problem that, 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 that you're seeing with these applications is typically that it is designed or hacked in afterwards rather than thought of before. Now you should really do something like security by design or privacy by design, meaning from the get-go, think about that, make sure security is built in and not as an afterthought. And it's super, super important these days. Privacy, yeah, same thing, conceived or hacked and afterwards or not considered at all. Quality assurance, uh, no staging environment. I will explain what that means in a moment. Automatic testing, uh, you have to have uh, that, of course, but uh, yeah, there are applications being built on, uh, in this world that don't have unit tests. So that's a big, big problem. Yeah, documentation, um, yeah, that's also widespread. You have meaningless names, uh, so I've, so one very popular, in German, very popular type of uh, business application, 
systems have table names that have acronyms. Yes, yeah? so you have tables like AC seven eight, and then there's this K eight five L table, yeah? and then then you have thousands of those, and the attribute names are not necessarily better than that. Yeah. And then you enter a company that has these. So what the heck? I mean, how am I going to? How can I work with, with such a system? Yeah, um, that is pretty terrible. And of course, it has all kinds of costs for. Yeah, it just costs the time you spend understanding this stuff, maintaining it, the errors yeah, by by misinterpreting tables and attributes. It's an absolute nightmare. Yeah, that you shouldn't do that. Yeah, so make sure that you name your tables and attributes well. Yeah. User roles of tables may be unclear. Who is allowed to read and write stuff? And uh, yeah, also the interactions of tables are unclear. Yeah? If you have thousands of tables, yeah, yeah, what is the idea? If you enter something here, um, does it correspond to something like that? Yeah, foreign keys. Yeah? Is there a foreign key relationship being defined or was it forgotten? Stuff like that. Yeah? So eventually you get to a point for large schemas that no one really understands the stuff anymore. Extensibility. Yeah? Um, yeah, that may, may be difficult in real systems uh, due to missing interfaces and then views or unknown dependencies in the code. Uh, again, uh, logical data independence may help here. A clear layering, a clear separation of concerns, standard software engineering things may help. Physical design. Um, yeah, did, did anyone even think about how to map, uh, how, how to create appropriate indexes, how to map the database system to specific hardware, to understand what are the performance problems, uh, how much data, uh, how much hardware has to be provisioned, stuff like that. Yeah? How do you fix these things? Um, I will talk about that briefly, um, what you can do in, in these scenarios. Okay, let's, but let's start with staging. So. Um, so if you deploy, um, be it a web application or any application, you typically use something that's called a deployment environment. Uh, so a deployment environment, you have uh, several versions of the same system and they're arranged in a pipeline. Yeah? So you typically have one system or multiple you use for development. And it can be your, your local laptop. Yeah? Each developer has a local laptop for development. If, if that's strong enough to run the system, that's fine. Then you have a second system that's a test system. Yeah, that's typically uh, the one that's used for a CI, continuous integration. Does ev everybody know what CI is? Who, who heard about CI? Not everyone. So continuous integration. Here we have um, at university, we have a system that's really super cool. That is GitLab. Uh, GitLab is the way to go for any kind of development task. It, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's basically a huge framework around Git allowing you to, to do better software development. And when you do software development um, and you wrote some stuff and you want to make sure that your stuff ends up in, uh, in the system. Yeah? You basically develop it on a separate branch called the feature branch. And then that feature branch is merged into what's called the main branch. That can be done in various ways by a real merge or by what's called a fast forward by appending it to the main branch. But how, how, however you do that, um, continuous integration means at some point you want to integrate your feature branch into the main branch. And you will only be allowed to do that if you pass all tests. Yeah? So the merge is dependent on unit tests that are executed. If your feature, what you implemented, breaks any test, the merge will be forbidden. Yeah? And that's the way to go. So you have to um, and, and for that, you will use a test system typically yeah, that runs the tests. We, we have a, um, we develop an application here in my group as well, where we have a test system. Yeah? Whenever I want to merge something, be it from myself or from, from a developer, yeah? first the tests must all run through. If that, that's the case, okay, I'm allowed to merge the stuff. Yeah? And that's very important. Um, so here you already have two systems. Then there's a third system that's a staging system. And that comes in different flavors. Staging system, I mean, there's, there's many ways to run that, but one is to say, I'm basically mimicking what production is doing. Yeah? So basically you deploy the entire system, have all the binaries, everything you ever need to run the system is deployed there. Also the final database system you're using. And even if that's possible, um, a copy of the real data, the data that's, that, 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 that you, that's used in the production system. Yeah? 
uh, if that's possible. You can, you can also do two systems. You can do staging one with fake data and staging two with, uh, with a copy of the real data. But basically, that's the last um, point in the pipeline where you can find bugs you didn't track before. Yeah? So what typically happens in software development is that um, yeah, you may pass uh, your tests, you may integrate some feature into main, but then you still get bugs, which typically indicates, oh yeah, that, that, that sh there should have been a test in the first place. Yeah? So staging typically gives you ideas on, oh yeah, oh, I should have written that test. Yeah? Which also means that when you see a bug, it typically means, okay, it's not only about fixing the bug, but it's adding a test to avoid that that bug will ever happen again. That's very important in software development. Yeah? Not only fixing, no, no. Yeah? Uh, a fix in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a development environment is always comes in a pair with a unit test that makes sure that that will never ever happen again. Don't worry, you find no new bugs. Don't worry, yeah? there are more opportunity for writing tests. Yeah? But, but that's very important. Yeah? But what you see then in development is this, the staging system will give you ideas on, oh yeah, that's a bug. Yeah? For instance, um, I don't, it just happened two days ago and, and the web uh, um, the, uh, application we are developing, I, I saw on staging that two bugs basically. Yeah? The tests were pa all passed, everything was fine, but on staging I, I saw, oh yeah, that's a bug. Yeah? So now we are fixing that, adding the test, and then let's hope it will never um, ever happen again. Yeah? So if you're happy with what you're seeing on staging, with, with a current version on staging, you may then manually deploy your software to the production system. That is a pro uh, system the customers are facing, the users are facing, your real customers facing this production system. Yeah? And uh, so whatever you copy over as a version from staging to production, you want to be really sure that that's a good version, otherwise you will break uh, things. Yeah? And that's how you develop. Yeah? And, um, and one of the cases, actually, uh, uh, I used to motivate uh, this slide set with, with banks crashing. Huh? Actually, <laughs> I'm not sure whether you heard about it. There was a major incident uh, in, uh, for, for multiple German banks were affected. They were using the same software. And guess what the security problem was? SQL injection. Yeah? So the SQL <laughs> injection again. And it stole, so there was a, an article in Saarbrücken a newspaper yesterday that uh, tens of thousands of customers of the insurance are affected. So SQL injection. Yeah? Anyway, yeah. But um, here one of those scenarios was not SQL injection I used to motivate. One of, one of the scenarios uh, I heard about, rumors, um, that what they did was they did a change directly in their production system. Yeah, and what they did was, uh, what, what I heard as a rumor was, they changed the um, banking number, this Bankleitzahl in German, um, in the production system directly to figure out that uh, all of a sudden they had banks, um, uh, different banks having the same Bankleitzahl, the same banking number. Yeah? Now your imagination, uh, should be enough to imagine what can happen <laughs> in this situation, right? You know, doing bank transfers to, to the wrong bank and whatever. It was a complete mess and, and they had really trouble um, getting back to, to a working uh, system. Yeah? So don't do that. Yeah? Always do these kind of things in staging. Yeah? If you crash staging, I mean, who cares? You just set it up uh, anew. Yeah? You just get it back up, you set it up anew, get the replica with the real data but the customer doesn't have to see that stuff. Yeah? It's just, uh, but if, 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 you, if you have a problem in production, well, then you're in trouble. Uh, let, let's hope for the best uh, that you don't have that. Uh. So these things are really important. Uh. Um, yeah. Yeah, the other is the performance things. Uh. So if you have performance problems in your application, and maybe on different levels, of course, and maybe on the application server, uh. Django, whatever, maybe on the web client, but yeah, let's face it, sometimes it's a database system, but there are many things that allow you to work around that. And one is called physical design advisory. So um, physical data independence is great, but ultimately someone has to define and configure how the data is physically stored. Yeah? So that's the job of a person called the database administrator. As a, a big project, there's someone who makes a decision, oh, I create that index, I use that hardware, this SSD, 
and that many servers to run my database system. If someone has to make the decision. This doesn't have to be done by the, by the people that define the schema. Yeah, it's a different crowd of people, but someone has to do this mapping to, to the physical layer. And that's the database administrator. The database system, of course, does some of the mapping itself, but the database administrator can, can override uh, some of these decisions. Yeah? And that, uh, there are tools that, uh, um, that help the database administrator. Yeah? So that's called physical design advisory. Yeah? So the, the database systems with uh, huge price tags have these kind of tools, like Oracle, for instance, and Microsoft as well, um, that, give, uh, that give hints. So basically what these tools do is, they analyze your data, they analyze the workload in the sense of the queries, and then they give recommendations for indexes to create. Yeah? They say, oh yeah, you better, I mean, come, this, this was it. Why didn't you create an index? Come on. Yeah? So it's, uh, if, I mean, now you would say, oh yeah, that's an AI, an AI making recommendations. Yeah? So basically, uh, these days it should be called physical design AI, right? Should change this uh, to make it, uh, but, but the, the people have worked on that for like, a, that, what was that? This AI. Huh. So it's doing some, some handwriting recognition. No, no AI will ever be able to recognize my handwriting. I'm, I'm really sure. <laughs> That's not going to happen in my lifetime. Okay, yeah, but basically, so it's not a semi automatic tool. Um, and giving you some ideas here. Yeah. And the, another interesting um, uh, thing people are working on, have been working on for, for, for decades, is called auto-tuning. Yeah? So basically making the job of the database administrator uh, super, superfluous, yeah? saying, okay, I mean, maybe a, a machine can do these kind of things. Yeah? And here's a, an example of a startup of a colleague from a CMU that does exactly that. Yeah? So basically analyzes data and workload, and then sets the knobs, makes the decisions um, a, a database administrator did um, originally automatically, and then you can show that you can uh, get qu quite some speed ups with, with such tools. Yeah, so there's, there's still things happening uh, in that regard. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting there. Okay, part four. So, um, maybe the horror story is here. Um, so no, this, I'm mentioning again here, okay, okay. Yeah, so data management, yeah? so we learned about that. Um, and we, we all often had this view in this lecture, yeah, there's this one database. Yeah? And then yeah, you have a query, you, to, you send it to this one database. If you look at um, organizations, yeah, there's typically a, a hierarchy, yeah? department X, department Y, sub-department Z, and so forth, and so forth, uh, and another company they acquired, and here's another company they acquired, and there's a board, blah, 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 blah. Yeah? And basically, uh, there's a saying, if you want to understand the IT architecture of any company, look at the organi organizational chart uh, first, because it corresponds very often to what you see in terms of IT. Yeah? It has to do with claims and power games, so people want to have their own server, yeah, their own database, yeah, they don't want to rely on someone, someone else's database. Yeah? No, it has to be my own database, yeah? my own server, and so forth and so forth. So that's unfortunately often the case. And that also means that query processing uh, uh, has to happen along the uh, organizational hierarchy. Yeah? If the data is not available in, in one of the database systems, maybe you have to um, send queries to multiple uh, database systems, and that leads to all kinds of data integration problems. Yeah, one of my favorites, uh, favorites uh, you're seeing often is um, what are this genuine knowledge or competence or the perceived uh, competence of people that, that work with databases. So there's perceived knowledge or, or sometimes also active concealment or ignoring of one's own lack of uh, knowledge. Yeah? So if you're in a situation uh, with colleagues, of course you don't want to lose, as it's called in English, you don't want to be embarrassed, uh, uh, get into an embarrassing situation by openly saying, yeah, I have no idea what this is about. Yeah? So if your boss tells you, hey, you should do the database stuff. Yeah? Please create a relational database schema. Yeah, yeah, I will do that. I know how to do that. Yeah? So it's um, career-wise, career it might be a bad decision to say, hey, boss, I have no idea what a relational database system is. Please give it to someone else. Yeah? That would be the... The, the honest way of saying that, 
But the, the reactions you typically see is that people, in particular engineers, they just know everything. No matter what you ask them for, they, they know everything. They're experts in everything. It's also, I think it's a very German phenomenon. You see it also. People talk about football, coronaviruses, or, yeah, you know, right? Yeah, everyone is an expert. We have 80 million uh, trainers of our national soccer team, um, and that's a problem. And I will say a few words about that. Yeah, and one, one other thing you see in an in industry, and that, that's very interesting, is um, this mix of concepts. Uh, we learned about concepts in this uh, lecture and then mapped it to specific implementations. And this all goes crisscross in a company. Yeah? So, but typically, engineers and companies never talk about concepts. You will ra rarely hear people saying, oh, yeah, relational algebra is so cool and relational model. No, they will all say tables and Spark and Pandas. And then I connected this with the LAMP stack to make it a container and Docker. Huh? What the heck? Yeah? So, uh, talking on a very technical implementation level, that, that's a real problem in these projects. And the other thing, um, are there technical terms, or so-called buzzwords, that are widely used in those projects and uh, it's sometimes used to show off, but, but also they, they lead to a lot of confusion in those projects. So, so we'll say a few things about that. Um, yeah, this horror story I, I linked to here is basically, um, I can briefly um, summarize that, maybe here. Where are my slides? Um, I want to show it on the laptop. Um, Slide number 19, here. Hold on. Yeah, it's this one. Well, you can read it back home, but basically it's a story about a guy who was asked, uh, so they had a performance problem with an old database system from the 60s or 70s or something. The boss decided, okay, let's go for a relational database system. And then they asked one of the old developers in that uh, company to do it. And then they, they, they didn't, the performance didn't get better. So they sent a consultant to understand what the heck was going on. And then they found out basically previously so the data management was file-based. And now what um, this developer did was he used the relational database system as a key value store where each tuple contained the contents of one file. That is what he did. Yeah, so basically, rather than doing relational modeling and breaking up the data into much f more fine granular uh, uh, data pieces, he just made one table yeah, with the file name and the contents of the file, and all the application logic was coded against that. Yeah, no performance improvement. Yeah, surprise, surprise. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's really, wow. <laughs> A wild story. Okay. Um, yeah. But uh, let's uh, look at what I call buzzword bullshit bingo. You will see that the first day you enter any company, you will, you will see that people play these games. Yeah? And um, what is the problem with that? Uh, so the problem is ambiguous uh, communication. Um, so um, the problem is how we use language uh, uh, with our brains. So if I say big data, if I say it, if I write it on a slide, if I write it in any text, that's just a symbol. And if I say big data, the question is, what do I mean by big data? And for a term like big data, the problem is it may mean many different things. It may mean, oh yeah, it's big, right? I mean, it's something like large. Yeah, probably that's what it means. So it means somehow a large data set, yeah, however that is defined. The actual definitions of what big data may mean uh, you, uh, one of those is called the four Vs. Uh, so volume, veracity, variety, stuff like that. I don't think it makes any sense, but there's a definition like that. Yeah? So for some people, big data may mean, oh yeah, it's this four Vs. Yeah, that's, that's what we meant. For other people, they may say, okay, no, big data, this, this is uh, this um, mass surveillance as done through, uh, by NSA. Or the, maybe it's Spark, maybe it's MapReduce, maybe it's NoSQL, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah? So the problem now occurs if someone else hears this. Yeah? So another person heard uh, this uh, person say big data. Yeah? So, oh yeah, he said big data. But the problem is that um, that person may have a different 
interpretation of what big data means. So it may mean that for this person, big data just means MapReduce. Yeah? So in other words, it could be that, okay, this person said big data, it uh, he or she meant large data. However, now this person heard big data, but for this person, uh, uh, big data means map reduce. Okay, so now we have a translation error here in the room, meaning large data got translated to map reduce. So large data, that's, that's basically the idea what this person wanted to express by saying big data. Yeah? But now it got translated to map reduce because big data in the brain of this person means map reduce. Yeah? And now you are in trouble. Yeah? And that's the problem with buzzwords. Yeah? And in clear communication, you have something like that. Yeah? So you have one person saying relational algebra, for instance, and it's crystal clear what's meant if someone says relational algebra. There's only one mapping to a meaning. Yeah? Basically, the stuff we learned in this class. Yeah? These Greek letters and joint symbols and stuff like that. Yeah? And if someone else hears that and he was educated in relational algebra, he or she has the same mapping to the same concept. Hence, there's no translation error whatsoever. The idea of relational algebra got translated to relational algebra and the brain of uh, the person on the right. Yeah, so far so, so clear. And uh, yeah, with that you can do what I call the buzzword bullshit bingo landscape. So basically here on the x-axis I'm depicting the number of different meanings for certain terms. Yeah? You have one meaning, one, one, one clearly defined meaning, few, many, and uh, infinite number of meanings. Yeah? And for many of the concepts we learned in this class, yeah, so if you, for, for all of these uh, examples at least, it's crystal clear what's meant. There's just one mapping to one meaning. And um, for, for others, however, there may be multiple meanings. For instance, for Hadoop, if someone says Hadoop, it's not crystal clear what's meant. Hadoop may mean Hadoop distributed file system, may mean Hadoop map reduce, may mean Hadoop whatever, whatever. Yeah? And for other terms, it gets even uh, less clear what they mean. Data science, what the heck is that going to mean? Or machine learning or AI, yeah? no SQL, and so forth, and so forth. Yeah? So the, the more um, a term is on the right yeah, towards the infinite number of interpretations, the more it's in this buzzword space. Yeah? And that's the problem with all of these buzzwords. They have so many interpretations that they are completely rubbish for any technical discussion. They don't make any sense because they don't make things clearer. They make uh, things harder to understand uh, because the meaning is so unclear. Huh? And uh, yeah, that's why I recommend if you, uh, if you are in a technical discussion, you should always make sure to use words in this space. If you want to get venture capital for your startup, make sure to always use words in this space. That's very important. Yeah. But, uh, but, but how that goes in a real discussion, for instance, at my, in my chair, be it in a bachelor, master thesis, PhD thesis, whatever, technical discussion, whenever I sense there is a term being used that is ambiguous, I say, stop, okay, so what do you mean by that term? Yeah? What do you mean by that? Oh, you mean that. Okay, now it's clear for everybody. Let's keep it like that. Yeah? Or when I feel like, okay, the term may have different meanings, we say, okay, oh, we need, okay, okay, we have, okay, we use it in two different ways. We, knew, we, knew, uh, we have to use two different symbols for that. So we define it and then we continue discussing. Uh, so it's, it's very important in technical discussions to, to make sure, hey, it's all, all, always only use terms that are crystal clear. Right? It, it makes your dis discussion go faster and faster if, if you do that. Yeah? But if you're in this space, um, it's very difficult. Yeah? And uh, that, that's a problem in an industry environment. Now, then you're joining a company and there are five experienced developers and they're using these terms. And then you say, hey, but Professor Dietrich said I should, shouldn't be using big data uh, and cloud in a discussion. Yeah? Yeah? Then there comes the social aspect. Uh, very hard to change these kind of behaviors when you, when you enter a company. Yeah? But um, I mean, you could try to internally map it to, to concepts. Yeah? Or, or you, you carefully ask, hey, what do you mean when you say cloud? Um, what technique specific? Just for me, I wasn't sure because there's so many different techniques. Could you just detail what you mean exactly? These kind of questions may help there. Yeah. 
Okay, then there's another confusion, and that is concept versus technology. Yeah? And that's the confusion of dimensions, basically. So there's one dimension that is these fancy sounding buzzwords. Yeah? We, we, uh, can you read that? Can you read that? Kind of, okay. So that's fancy sounding buzzwords. Yeah? Big data, AI, NoSQL Cloud, you name it. And yeah, that's dimension one, yeah? fancy sounding buzzwords, labels and terms. Then there's uh, another dimension that's um, dimension two. That those are te technical principles and patterns, concepts, best practices, stuff we learned in this lecture, a lot of the, the, those stuff. Yeah? Relational algebra, relational model, blah, 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 and so forth. Those are, that's dimension two. Yeah? And um, basically, when you look at that, uh, those technical principles, um, it, it's clear. Yeah? So basically, um, predicate pushdown we talked about a lot. It's clear what it means. It's filter and project data as early as possible. And there's, um, there's so many, uh, there's really 50 shades of predicate pushdown in the databases, um, a book I've never written, but I should write probably, huh? because it's, it occurs everywhere. It's, it's so fun. It's, mis it's a bit like the relational model huh? or relational algebra. It's so fundamental, it's, I mean, it, it's just everywhere. Huh? And that, that holds for all these other terms as well. Huh? If I say relational model, um, yeah, it's clear, it's model or data, it's multi-attribute sets, but don't confuse it with tables, data frames, column stores, or row stores, because that would be dimension three. Dimension three is about concrete implementations of those concepts, software platforms, libraries, and stuff like that. Yeah? And you shouldn't confuse that. Here where this uh, purple dimension, dimension two, is really about the concepts, yeah? relational algebra, yeah, it just it's clear what it means. It's query those sets through a combination of simple set valued functions. That's that's what we learned in this class. Yeah, and that's, that's all you need to know about that. Yeah? And that's a very clear meaning. And so forth and so forth. Yeah? So that's a concept, and that is technical implementations. Yeah? So some library, some DuckDB, some PostgreSQL, Spark, Flink, whatever, Mongo or whatever Python library doing uh, X, Y, Z. You know, those are the software platforms and libraries. And the problem is, uh, what you should be aware of is, please don't confuse these dimensions. Yeah, it, it's really important yeah, because um, what you learn in class here at, at uh, university and where you should really excel, or uh, let's phrase it differently, the space where problems are solved are dimension two. Here you solve problems. You don't solve problems in dimension three. Yeah, you don't solve a problem by installing Postgres and uh, uh, Postgres uh, uh, Django ORM wrapper yeah, and then connecting it to um, uh, whatever UI framework view or REST or, or you name it. No, you solve it on the conceptual level, meaning, okay, I have to create a data model, be it an object-oriented object schema or relational schema, through, and then use an ORM to, um, so ORM is a concept, it's not a specific platform, use an ORM to provide the data to my application and then I have some sort of uh, user interface framework. That's the conceptual level. Yeah? And that is where a computer scientist solves problems, not on dimension two. Yeah? Uh, not on dimension three, yeah? but, but you, what you will see in practice is many developers talk about these dimensions only, and that's a huge problem yeah? because you, you also get a lock-in effect. If someone says, yeah, I use Apache Spark to solve X, Y, why Apache Spark? And the problem could also be solved with five different other libraries. Yeah? You, why are you focusing on Apache Spark? Yeah? And that's a problem. So you always try to pull back discussions back to dimension two. Yeah? Solve it there. And once you have an idea how to solve the problem well, yeah, then you can make a decision how to map it to dimension three. Now, which are the tools you're gonna pick for that? What are the right tools? Yeah? That's the right way of doing that. Yeah, not starting with that one. Yeah, yeah so you get rid of this one. Oops, you should, hey, why doesn't this work again? So you should get off uh, this one. Yeah, this is really not helping in technical uh, discussions. Uh, this is super important. And once you're done with that, you map it to, um, the con the, the, to specific software platforms and concrete implementations. That's the way to go. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and that's, that's my favorite. Um, I just wanna mention this one because I uh, uh, bumped into this last, uh, if, yeah, okay, time-wise we're okay. Um, that's a consultation scenario I was dragged in uh, last year, um, but I basically then said, no, I'm not gonna consult you. It just was, it was one or two sessions we did 
So there was a large web application with terribly slow performance. It really had minutes instead of milliseconds. So we're talking about performance problems on the order of factor 10,000 and more, slower than it should be for web application. It's, uh, I got curious because I had a lack of imagination. How can you make a web application 10,000 times slower? I want to know about that. That sounds cool. Huh? And so it was an SAP system with about 100,000 tables. Apparently no or hardly any views uh, I was aware of. And um, so the performance numbers were basically ridiculous. And uh, yeah, so the solution space, if you are confronted with something like that, is of course you first profile. You have to understand what is the problem? Where is the problem in this huge stack? Yeah? So is it the application? Is it the database query? Is it some network problem? That's the first thing you need to find out as a computer scientist. Where the heck is that happening? Yeah? Um, and in particular for, for a database system, that also means, hey, I, I can think about, is it a single query that's slow? If the system has no load, and gets a specific query, I already see the problem, or is it just because there's so much load on the system? Yeah, and then I see the problem. That you have to find out and really separate. That's very important. Huh? So you start profiling something like that on an underutilized system, on a staging system, for instance, and try to find out, okay, do I already see the problem or no? Huh? You, you, you look at physical design indexes and partitioning and stuff um, to fix these things. Huh? Yeah, there are more than 30,000 users in this web application. Um, so what can you do in the solution space uh, with regard to that? You should clarify um, the load distribution. Yeah? When does the load happen? At which time of the day? Which part of the application creates load? Is that a problem? You can do things like if the application server and database server, server are on the same, set, uh, same physical machine or even virtual machine, uh, you can check out wh whether that's a load problem. You can put them on different servers. You should have clear performance monitoring. Yeah? So you should never deploy an application without monitoring. The first thing you monitor is the application even online. Is it alive? There are separate services out there that ping your application and send you an email if your system goes down. Yeah? That's the first thing you do. But even better is you have performance monitoring. Yeah? So you have um, um, checks built in, a system built in that gives you an alert if, if, your, if your system uh, gets lower than X. Yeah? I mean, you, you, do, you shouldn't wait for the users to write emails. Uh, you don't want to do that. Yeah? Yeah, one important thing is uh, that you could ch check early on is also this Kiwi principle. I think I mentioned it before. Kill it with iron. For instance, you see that data is stored on hard disks. The first thing you do is throw it away, get SSDs. Uh, maybe that solves already the problem. And what you can also do, we also, we're doing that currently for our web application, is you do performance load tests. Yeah, you can do that on a staging server. You can, yeah, if you make the staging server, get, give it the same data as a, um, as a production server, you run load tests on that staging server to find out, okay, when is it gonna break? What has to happen before my application breaks? Yeah, then you know how far you can go with your application. And then if you see in your production server, oh, I know beyond 500 users I'm in trouble, and now 400, user 499 enters the system, maybe you can react in advance. So these are things you can do. Huh? Yeah, then there were all kinds of social problems and uh, responsibility problems. So the project setup was like three companies or three organizations, let's phrase it like that, involved in the development, each with several managers, project leads, sub-project leads, developers, with very different database knowledge. Yeah? Actually, only one of the people in the team has had a good database knowledge. Yeah? And that's a problem because some of the people even didn't know how to profile that. Um, uh, scenario. And what was happened was there was finger pointing. Yeah? So each of these three companies were pointing, no, that's the other company is to blame. No, no, it's uh, that one. Yeah? And they did the same. Oh, no, then it's not my fault. And it must be your fault. Yeah? But no one dared to profile what the problem was. Yeah? They just were finger pointing uh, to not be responsible. Yeah? So the solution really um, uh, is really to profile a query um, to understand where is the problem and then speak to the appropriate people and try to fix it. Yeah? The problem here was actually several performance problems were combined. Yeah, and from a management perspective here, it's important to identify and address the knowledge deficits and stuff. Yeah? And then you have two options. You either train the people appropriately, 
Uh, you can also put them to different tasks. So that's the third option. But if you feel like that someone is not suitable for the job, you have to fire that, that, that guy or woman. And I mean it as I say it. It's, it's really poison in a, in a team if you have people that cannot catch up uh, with, with, with the technology you need for that team. I mean, what, what, what do you want with such a team member? Eh? You have to, put, it, have to put, put that guy or woman elsewhere. Yeah? I mean, this is really poison. Uh, for a team eh? and managers responsible for identifying those people and getting rid of those people. Sorry, that's, that's how it is. Yeah, and you have to establish clear roles, responsibility of physical design. And there was also an issue here. It wasn't clear who is even doing physical design. No, I don't know. So, in summary, um, so there was a lack of a fit between training and task. Yeah? So database technology is often used by people who have no real clue. Yeah? which is then aggravated by the fact that these people often believe that they have a clue. Yeah? So they believe they're cool and great and understand the stuff, but they have no clue. Yeah? And then these people are also often resistant to advice yeah? Yeah? with this attitude, oh, I'm an engineer, I know how this works, right? Yeah? And that this unpleasant mixture leads, leads to a variety of performance problems, security issues, architectural mistakes, including purchasing decisions yeah? at enormously high costs. Yeah? And the analogy I want to give you for that is really, I mean, would you have your teas treated by someone who actually learned to be a baker? Maybe not. Yeah? I'm happy. I have a very good taste. This tea is really great, yeah? fantastic. But in the IT business, it's very often that people who didn't study computer science, who don't know about the concepts, but they then studied physics or chemistry and did some programming course, and they devise those huge architectures and systems. This is a completely stupid idea. Sorry, I haven't ever seen a system created by a physicist that was great. Sorry, I still need to see that system. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's how I am. Because, I mean, why do we run these programs? Because there's, there's so many things that can go wrong, so many conceptual things that have to be uh, done the right way. That's why you're studying computer science or whatever, DSAI or whatever you study. Yeah? Because it's difficult, but I mean, yeah. If you want to do a brain surgery, I mean, don't do it in two months and then you can do brain surgeries. That's not how this works, right? I mean, it's like 10 years of learning and then you can do brain surgery, right? I mean, that's how it works, yeah. Yeah, so ensure that those who use the tool understand the tool. Yeah? And uh, yeah, for databases, that's my message. Yeah? Or to put it a little bit more pointy, if you are managed by someone who only has business knowledge but no technical knowledge, then run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, to try to get to a different, it doesn't make any sense. It's in vain. Forget it. It's not never going to fly. It's never going to be a great product. I'm not seeing that. Uh, so to sum up what we learned today. So the main takeaway here is when it comes to using database technology in IT projects, there can be quite a discrepancy between what should be done and what is done. You know? How to cope with that? If you have to deal with database technology, be careful of the pitfalls. And I mentioned many in this lecture today and uh, the entire semester. Most of the perceived database problems with web applications can be solved relatively easily. This includes most, if not all, perform performance problems. This means in particular, if you see companies, oh yeah, we can't solve that, we have to buy another system. No, you don't. You don't have to buy another system. I mean, it's really rare that with existing technology you can't solve the problem. It's typically solved with existing technology. It's rare that you have to buy fancy, super duper other system. Be extra careful when it comes to security and privacy risk issues. It's, it's really a minefield. It's super, you have to get a security expert or a couple of them into your project. And if in doubt, ask an expert, not a wannabe expert, wannabe expert. Yeah? Make, does he really understand what he's talking about? It's, it's, it's hard to find out. Yeah? For instance, I mean, it just, for instance, yeah? assume you want to hire a security expert. Yeah? Of course, then yeah, you Google for security expert, and then there's a nice web page, security expert. But how do you find out whether the guy or the woman is a security expert? It's really hard. Yeah? So maybe you want to have a recommendation by someone who knows uh, a bit more about security and, and, and can make that decision. Yeah, the guy is good, the woman is good or, or not so good. Yeah? So they have to be really careful to, to find the right people. Yeah? Okay, yeah, with that, I think that's all I wanted to say today. So good luck in your future. I mean, uh, just, I mean, eventually you graduate. Uh, let's hope for the best. You all graduate with bachelor, master, whatever. 
It's totally fine if you end up in a company eventually. Drop me a line, write me an email, share your horror stories. Or, or, or share stories like, I mean, Professor, this was all bullshit. My, my, my company is perfect. They do exactly what you, what, what you told me in class, right? And even before I entered. Yeah? I mean, if that is what, what you go through in your, in your company, let, let me know about that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, fine. It, it doesn't all have to be horror stories. It can be uh, paradise stories. Yeah? That's fine. Yeah? But just drop me a line eventually because I'm really um, curious to, to learn more about these things. With that, let's call it a day. See you next week. Yeah? <clears throat>